to know more such amazing stories from Indian history, click the bell icon and subscribe to Live History India. This is one of the few miniatures in which Mughal Emperor Jahangir is shown wielding a bow. Perched on a globe depicting the world, he has his arrow aimed at the impaled head of his enemy, his nemesis, the black slave turned general and defender of the Deccan, Malik Ambar, who put up quite a stand against first Akbar and then Jahangir in the early part of the 17th century. An African who started his life as a slave, Malik Ambar went on to have one of the most spectacular military careers in medieval Deccan. Originally from Ethiopia or Abyssinia, Ambar was also the most famous of the many Africans who rose to great power in the subcontinent during this era. Dr. Omar Ali has done seminal work on the Africans in world history and has had a special focus on Malik Ambar, the slave who became a general and who took on the mighty Mughals. Hi Omar, it's so lovely to have you with us from North Carolina. Thank you so much. Omar, a lot of what you do is around the Indian Ocean Trade Network. We don't focus enough on this in India, but it's a very, very interesting um, aspect of Indian history, the subcontinent's history. Uh, and you've done a lot of work, uh, very interesting work in this area. So let me start by asking you, what got you interested in Malik Ambar? I think that for me, I've always thought of myself as doing world history. Um, and I've been interested in the African presence and contributions and role in the making of the modern world uh, in terms of the African diaspora. And I think that for me, I came to Malik Ambar in part because um, my father being from India, me studying uh, in West Africa and having done work in the African diaspora in the Atlantic world, looking at Muslims, and then migrating slowly over to the East in terms of my scholarship, I, it became clear to me that Malik Ambar was a figure that needed to be given greater attention in world history, that people knew about him in India and people have written about him um, in the United States and other parts of the world. However, it, it hadn't entered really the popular imagination. And he's just this extraordinary figure. And I wanted to build on the great works and the pioneering uh, scholarship of scholars before me, mostly from India, and in some ways give uh, this story to the world to inspire people to look at the broader Indian Ocean Network and the presence of Africans in that part of the world, uh, which is a lesser known story. That's great, Omar. You know, the actual connection with the Siddhis goes back a long way as far as India is concerned. We have early references to them uh, in the Delhi Sultanate up north, for instance, uh, and they play an important role, of course, not as much as in the Deccan. How far back does this connection between India and Africa really go? There is documentary evidence going back to the first century common era in the Periplus of the Erythrian Sea, which is basically um, looking at the places where people are doing trade. Uh, it's a guide for mariners and traders. And it, it, it points to connections between the Horn of Africa, Ethiopia, and the western part of India. And this is some of the earliest documentation we have of this network of people, products, and ideas moving across the western part of the Indian Ocean. It's a sustained contact that is part of the greater monsoons, uh, which in some ways is, can characterize as sort of a conveyor belt, uh, where about four months, you know, you have one the movement going one way, and then it slows down and stops for another four months, and then it reverses course. So in some ways, there's a natural flow of people uh, who are moving about as merchants, as traders, as proselytizers of the religions, as explorers, as uh, slaves ultimately as part of the military slave system and ultimately Malik Ambar is part of that system. Tell us about Malik Ambar's story. It's a real drags to riches story uh, and uh, it's quite spectacular because he plays such an important role in the history of the Deccan. How far back do you trace his story? 
So we don't have very much direct evidence of the specifics of his life um, as a child and early teenager. Uh, we have some references afterwards pointing to this. Uh, most of the work that has been done on Malik Ambar, that has been done mostly by South Asian scholars, has a, a few lines, maybe a paragraph pointing to this African origin of Mali Gambar in terms of what may have been happening there, if at all. And uh, what I tried to do is in some ways reconstruct the period of time in which he was living and in some ways build him into that context. And I'm very careful to say one can imagine uh, these are the conditions under which he would have lived, et cetera, to not say that this is definitively what he was doing. But uh, as a historian, you want to tell a story. And I think that people are hardwired uh, to listen to stories. So you don't want to have too many qualifiers, but you need to qualify that this is based on sources and this is what we can ascertain. So we know that he was uh, from an Oromo family. Oromos is one of the largest ethnic groups, nations, if you will, of which uh, he, there were tensions that were happening at that time, and his family and people were likely caught between the tensions between Christian Ethiopians and Muslim uh, Ethiopians on the coast of the Adal Sultanate. And he was likely enslaved as a child, caught into the crossfires of this, um, these, these warring factions, warring groups of people, uh, warring nations, if you will. These are nations within nations. And he's taken in, 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 into slavery, and uh, clearly has some gifts because people decide who own him to give him some uh, further education and training. And ultimately he will end up in Baghdad uh, where he's given more of a proper education and then taken to the Deccan and joins this incredibly rich um, uh, Ethiopian presence in South Asia. Uh, first under a fellow Abyssinian, which is another word for Ethiopian, um, and then ultimately rising to power on his own. Right, let's look at uh, Malik Amber in India and the early years. He was, of course, a slave to uh, Chinggis Khan, who was a Peshaw of Murtaza Nizam Shah. Chinggis Khan had a major falling out with Murtaza, uh, and uh, Malik Amber, in a way, had to chart a course himself in a in a land and an era which was in complete flux. Well, I think, as you point out, there's a period of great uncertainty and flux. In fact, there was no single figure that was trying to rally the various um, sultanates in this area. There were basically five, and they were at times working cooperation, at times warring against each other. But the, the overriding threatening force was that of the Mughals, who were to the northern part of, of, of India, who were basically trying to take over slowly the Deccan. And so there is a figure, uh, a, a female figure that arises, and, and Chan Bibi is named, who's, who's basically this larger than life, I think, figure, uh, who I, I believe helped to inspire Malik Ambar's sense of independence and uh, sense of, um, it's it's not nationalism. It's a it's sort of a proto-nationalism, but it's a sense of pride in the independence of the Dakani sultanates. And um, he had been under her at one point in his rise uh, to power, first as a military um, slave, but then essentially freed up and becoming a mercenary soldier and then a mercenary general. Uh, and so he is basically using um, his skills, his expertise, which he learned in the court under Malik Dabira, Chengiz Khan is his other name. Um, and he basically becomes the major rallier of the different factions and people that are in this area to keep the Deccan uh, independent, inspired by her work and her fierce independence. And as a woman, um, especially uh, you know, in the United States, we're celebrating the 100 year anniversary of women's suffrage. So there's more attention on women's history. She's just an extraordinary uh, world historical figure. She is really an amazing woman and we must do uh, more on her. But let's keep it to Malik Amber right now. Uh, there's this very famous uh, portrait of Jahangir uh, holding a, a, a bow and arrow, uh, you know, uh, aimed at Malik Amber's impaled head. We started this uh, show with that uh, that miniature you know that tells a lot about how Jahangir hated Malik Ambar because Malik Ambar really did stand up to him and to Akbar before him 
and managed to get a, a lot of people rallying around him, be it the Marathas or the Siddhis or Habshis. So he was quite unique in that uh, context. Yes, and that's a really important point that you're making is that there were many different groups of people and he was able to bring together and sustain um, a, a kind of rebellion and a defense against the Mughals by bringing together basically the Marathis and the Habshis, which is another term for people of African descent. Uh, you have Ethiopian, Abyssinian, uh, Sidi, uh, Habshi. These are all references to people of African descent in the, in the archives. So yes, he is a charismatic leader. And I think that um, I, I, I think it's, you, you can tell how powerful of a figure he was because people from different, um, different areas of the world were talking about him. In fact, everyone uh, from, you know, Philip II is basically referencing this, this figure uh, in South Asia, all the way, you know, in Iberia, making reference to him, to, uh, to Portuguese uh, traders, to, of course, the Mughals, and, of course, other fellow um, uh, regents and, and rulers in, in the Deccan. So many people were talking about him and is, is piecing together that archival um, uh, evidence to construct his story and, and retell this extraordinary life that he lived. And in some ways, he is extraordinary, and yet he was part of many, many um, Africans who were part of the military slave system who did rise to power. And there was a, a kind of an Abyssinian uh, nobility uh, that had been uh, created, uh, that had been forged in. And we know this also from the beautiful images. You mentioned this, this um, painting, but there, there are other paintings depicting these Africans in these very regal and noble positions of power. And as somebody who has taught uh, about the African diaspora in the Atlantic world, it comes to much of a surprise to many people in that part of the world. In fact, um, you know, also in the Indian Ocean world and other parts of the world, that there was such uh, esteem and regard for Africans and that they had achieved such positions of power and eminence. And the Mughal chroniclers uh, wrote about this. Uh, we know about this upon Malik Ambar's death. Uh, Mughal chroniclers talk about uh, Malik Ambar in this way that's uh, it seems like almost it's written from not an enemy, but from somebody who's uh, deeply admiring of, of, of this person. Right. It is said that the Abyssinians uh, did really well in India uh, because of the topography. Uh, they could really adapt to the terrain of the Western Ghats, and that's why they kind of mastered the art of guerrilla warfare and were very sought after mercenaries. Uh, what can you tell us about that? It's an interesting... Um, point that you're highlighting. I think that, you know, I think that there was sort of a reputation that um, East Africans had uh, gained over time as great warriors. And it had to do perhaps with some of their earlier training and experiences in East Africa. Um, but it's also probably the case that some of them weren't. <laughs> but I think in general, there was this sort of aura and, and reputation that had been created. And we know this also from an earlier accounts, uh, for instance, uh, the great um, traveler uh, Ibn Battuta uh, from North Africa, written in, uh, he, he dictated his accounts over the course of two decades, traveling across much of this world, talked about these Abyssinians um, guarding um, trade ships, and that if pirates knew that there was an Abyssinian on a ship, um, they would actually keep away from it because they knew that they, they wouldn't be able to overtake it. So there's a sort of aura and um, an appreciation for Africans as as military, as soldiers, as combatants. Um, but what's really important is also to understand the African, uh, the East African contributions in other realms, um, in, in terms of as administrators, um, as ministers. Uh, it's a different world there where a slave can rise to power in a way that's not seen in the Atlantic world in the um, in the dominant uh, political systems. And so um, Africans were not just tapped as uh, for their warrior skills, but also as administrators and ministers. And, and in fact, there's also, um, you know, sort of a Sufi tradition, uh, which many people uh, follow, which are of African descendants in India um, as artists. Um, and so there's multiple contributions, not just in the military realm. Tell me, I'm curious, uh, Omar, you know, while we know of Malikambar's uh, uh, stint in India and his career in India, we know little about his linkages uh, with Africa after he came here. Do you think uh, 
there were linkages? Did he try to reach out? What does your research actually tell you? I think that our notions of today of race and of even returning home um, may not hold in the same way as they did at that time. So I think that um, it's not to say that people didn't see racial distinctions, but race is a social construct um, which is fundamentally grounded in political power and who's in power determines the categories. And so at this point in time, we don't have the same kind of racial constructions as we would a little bit later, and especially in the Atlantic world. So he did have in some ways connections and it seemed like he did gravitate towards other Abyssinians. I think the fact that Malik Dabir is the person who purchased him as part of a thousand slaves when he first arrived in the Deccan um, sometime in the 1570s, he, he, he seems to have um, gotten his um, favor because he was, cult he, was, he was developed in the court. And that's where he learned many of his skills as an administrator, as, as somebody who uh, oversees sort of um, uh, and manages court affairs, which would serve him well as he became regent uh, minister. And so there is a, a, a perhaps a, a connection in the fact that he is going to marry a fellow Abyssinian, that he in some ways was particularly good at bringing together the Habshi in his, in his um, armies. And he was also good at building bridges and organizing the Marathas around him as well. It's important to note that he isn't the first person to do that, but I think that he's perhaps the most effective. And he will be, just as he was inspired by Chan Bibi, to be independently fierce and look for the, the interests of the Deccan as a whole against Mughal incursions, uh, he would also inspire later leaders, um, in, in, namely Shivaji, who is a great Maratha leader, um, whose great grandfathers uh, had actually served in Malik Ambar's uh, army. So there is a there's a connection uh, here between you know Chan Bibi to Malik Ambar to Shivaji, which is utterly fascinating. So Malik Ambar, I think was appreciative of, of his African roots by virtue of, I think, the decision to marry a fellow Abyssinian um, and his support of other Habshis. But there's no evidence of him wanting to go back to Africa, per se. Right. Um, you know, after Malik Amber's rise uh, as a mercenary to a general, there is another very interesting facet about him as an administrator. He sets up Kharki, which is a new city, his new uh, base, uh, which later becomes Aurangabad after Aurangzeb comes. He also gets his daughter married to a Nizam Shah prince, uh, and he becomes extremely powerful. Uh, there's a gentrification of sorts, uh, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, what uh, uh, insights have you got from that era? Yes, and I think it comes out more as he attains power and he has more of the resources of, of the court and, and his, the Sultanate of Ahmadinejad at his disposal. Uh, but he's a very um, strategic minded uh, ruler. Uh, he's the de facto ruler, right? Um, and he basically is making sure that the fortifications are reinforced, they're rebuilt, that they in some ways are bringing together uh, people uh, in the countryside uh, by incentivizing their ownership of their own land, um, by working it more because they don't have to give up as much taxes, and knowing that in some ways he is able to produce more um, it, revenues that way, it, is, it helps further the cause of, of, of defending, of being, as I describe him, the defender of the Deccan. And so he's a very astute administrator, land manager, uh, uh, diplomat, um, military general and commander. He has multiple skills and, and the Mughals write about this. I was hoping I might be able to read just one uh, statement made by one of the Mughal chroniclers upon his death. May I do so? Please do, Omar. Okay, this comes uh, from the Malik Ambar book um, made reference to um, that came out in 2016. Um, and um, I'm hoping to make uh, an updated version sometime soon with some of the materials that I that has been shared with me that can fill in a couple of gaps. So this comes from the Mughal court chronicler Mutama Khan, uh, 
1627 in the memoirs of Jahangir, who you made reference to, who has this painting of him shooting an arrow into the into into Malik Ambar because he just can never defeat him and even though he might gain some land in the Deccan they always have to pull back because uh, they um, they can't maintain their their control so this is what he writes this is a Mughal chronicler okay he says in warfare in command in sound judgment and in administration he had no rival or equal he kept down the turbulent spirits, maintained his exalted position to the end of his life, and closed his career in honor. And I think it really speaks to the admiration he had, not just uh, among his own, uh, in his own uh, sultanate, and, but among even his enemies who regarded him as a, as a, as a formidable um, foe. You know, uh, Malik Ambar died at the age of 80, which is a ripe old age, uh, yet the Mughals did make their entry into uh, the Deccan. Uh, so looking back, what's the legacy of Malik Ambar? Is it the fact that uh, it continued, his legacy continued through the Siddhis of Janjira, etc.? As a historian who's worked on him, uh, what do you think? I think that um, he his legacy is literally in the building of, of the city of Kadki, you know, which then gets renamed um, later on. But it's also in all the fortifications that he re rebuilt and, and extended uh, in the land that produced uh, the food for the people to sustain their lives um, to the Janjira Island uh, rulers. And in some ways, his own lineage, if you will, which gets, um, if you will, diluted in a sense, like we, we lose track of, of who is a Malik Ambar descendant? But clearly, there is a, a, there is a there is a component of a Malik Ambar lineage family in the Deccan there, and um, and it's I think it's in the inspira inspiration of of being that sort of defender of the Deccan, which is picked up by the Marathas later on in their own, if you will, uh, independent struggles and and efforts to defend their areas and expand their control of the region. I think also panning out even further, uh, Malik Ambar is, is in some ways a source of inspiration and offers a counter narrative to the dominant um, sort of characterization of Africans being only slaves and being um, subordinate in all ways, uh, if not most ways, to other quote races. And I think challenges the notion of slavery as something that is actually quite um, malleable and, and flexible in the Indian Ocean world. So it challenges our understanding of race, um, slavery, of the role of Africans and the contribution of just the making of uh, South Asian in the Indian Ocean world, but also of world history. So there are multiple ways I think that his legacy continues. And I think that at a time right now, as, you, as we know, there's a lot of strife um, in the United States, but in other parts of the world, and Africans and people of African descent um, have been in some ways uh, victimized by violence uh, here in the United States, uh, but in other parts of the world have really uh, struggled against uh, racism. In India, that has been uh, just really appalling. And the, the exhibit that was traveling on African elites in India um, helped to in some ways bring a different narrative. But I think that we struggle with issues of racism towards different groups of people, but Africans, because of the transatlantic slave trade, have been in some ways hit hardest by uh, racism in present times. And I think that Malik and Bar serves as a, as a, as a, in some ways a symbol of the greatness of people of African descent and inspiration for people who want to, in some ways, better understand the complexity and inextricable connections between all peoples in world history. Um, so those are some of the legacies I see um, of Malik Ambar. Right, it's, it's really true, uh, especially given what's happening in the US these days. Uh, but uh, let's uh, wrap up this conversation uh, and look at the broader spectrum of your work, Omar. It's really fascinating, as I said, the Indian Ocean trade has layers and layers to it. And sadly, um, there's a lot more work that needs to be done. A lot of the scholarship is in the West uh, and uh, we need to look at uh, the history of the region through different uh, perspectives. Uh, what are the interesting insights that you have gleaned uh, through your research? Well, I think you're right. There's, um, there's 
a lot to be explored and a lot to be um, educated. And I think that you're right that the historiography, the dominant stories are coming out of Western scholarship. And I'm personally a beneficiary of the South Asian scholars who really pioneered the, the biography and the, the work uh, to bring out his story. And it's, I'm very much building on those traditions. Um, but I think that there is um, uh, oftentimes less attention to uh, South Asia in general um, in terms of uh, the ways in which South Asia figures into the um, into world history. Uh, for instance, in Islamic studies, you, you know, there's an there's an emphasis on the Arab lands and Persia, and only secondarily to South Asia and you know East Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. But I think that my my work as a world historian who looks at the global African diaspora has been to make, try to make connections. Um, I'm, I mentioned that part of my interest was my father, um, Amir Hamid Ali, who was from Pune. And uh, I dedicated this book to him. Uh, we, we had worked on it together. He helped me with some of the translations from Persian. Uh, he was a lover of history as well. And, um, and I think that for me, it's seeing those connections between people across the world. So in the Atlantic world, I've looked at the histories of African Americans. I'm here in North Carolina. Um, in fact, outside of my window, there's the Guilford Woods, uh, which was the site of the Underground Railroad. It was the southern terminus of the Underground Railroad, which helped um, Africans and, and people of African descent to come out of slavery to the work of Quakers and free black people. And this search for freedom is something that you see across the Americas, in the maroon settlements and runaway uh, slave communities across uh, you know, Latin America uh, in the Caribbean. And you see people who uh, assume power and take power. Uh, but what's really extraordinary is that you have in South Asia people who take power, that is of African descent, who are part of the system. So there are different pathways to power, um, but I think that there is a shared longing for freedom defined very, very broadly, because while people were um, freeing themselves, oftentimes they were also enslaving people. So it's complicated, the nature of history. And, um, and I think there's much for South Asian scholars to learn from the Americas and certainly from America, from the American scholars, I'm talking about across the Americas, the Latin America as well, to learn from the South Asian experiences. And I think that getting that perspective, that broader perspective enriches our own understanding of the areas that we dive and focus in on in our research and in our teaching of, of these histories. Yes, uh, history is completely about context and that's why we have scholars like you who are looking at history from a larger perspective across continents on uh, Live History India. Thank you so much Omar and hope to see a lot more of you here. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this conversation as well. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I look forward to more conversations.